Livestream event today. We are talking about Mesozoic Ecosystems live here from the Museum of the Rockies. We are super excited to be sharing this time with you today and I'd like to thank you for joining us here in Bozeman, Montana. I'm Jamie, I'm the Outreach Program Manager and I'll be your MC. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. John Scanella, the John R. Horner Curator of Paleontology, and Mr. Scott Williams, the Paleontology Lab and Field Specialist. John coordinates paleo research and the scope of the fossil collection, while Scott helps coordinate fossil preparation and paleo field work. For us today are also our friends and partners at Streamable Learning. If we have any IT issues, they are here to help type those on into the chat box and let them know if you can't see us or hear us or anything of that sort. Thanks for being with us, Streamable Learning. Feel free to use the chat box also at any point to type in any questions you might have for us. We might also ask you questions along the way. If we're not able to respond to questions immediately, we will leave some time at the end of the program to get those questions answered for you. So bear with us. Before we begin, we're gonna take a short tour of the Museum of the Rockies, the upstairs. We're here in the basement. If you've seen this before, hang tight. If you haven't, we're excited to show you where we work. Okay, here we are in Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman is about 80 miles north of Yellowstone National Park and 315 miles south of Canada. Is there anyone with us from Canada today? We are nestled in the beautiful and historic Gallatin Valley on the campus of Montana State University. Those of you who have been here before, maybe you kiddos from Ennis might recognize this guy, Big Mike. Can you tell us what kind of dinosaur Big Mike is? Real quick, check that in the chat box. Any guesses? Got T-Rex, 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 T-Rex. T-Rex it is, good job. <laughs> We're gonna talk more about T-Rex um, today. As we adventure into the museum, oh, there he is again, and again, into the dinosaurs of the Under the Big Sky exhibit, um, you will see a few dinosaurs. Museum of the Rockies is fortunate to have one of the largest collections of North American dinosaurs. Um, as we go into the Horns of Hall, <laughs> Hall of Horns and Teeth, say that 10 times fast, you'll see our friend the Allosaurus. Uh, if you can see back there in the back, there's a marine reptile, the Plesiosaur. And then as we go into the Hall of Horns and Teeth, we meet the T-Rex and Triceratops, which John and Scott will also tell us more about today. Thanks for joining me. We are just below all of this stuff um, in our collection facility. And from here, I'm gonna turn it over to John and Scott. Thanks again for joining us. Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here at the Museum of the Rockies. As Jamie just said, we are currently downstairs in one of the collections areas at the museum. And so if you look behind me, you can see all kinds of cases and cabinets, and they're all filled with the fossils of dinosaurs and other ancient creatures. And so part of uh, what we do here at the museum is try to understand what these creatures were like when they were alive. Now, wherever you may be joining us from, if you look out your window or go for a walk, uh, you might uh, encounter some plants and animals. And if you spend some time watching them, uh, you might be able to see what they're doing, what they're eating, how they're interacting with each other. You can learn a lot about the creatures in your environment just by sort of watching them. But if you're a paleontologist, a scientist that studies ancient life, it can be a bit more difficult uh, to get a good picture of what creatures that lived millions of years ago uh, were like because we can't just walk outside and see a Tyrannosaurus rex walk by and, and look at what it's eating and what it's doing. Uh, and so in order to get a good idea of uh, what ancient ecosystems were like and how creatures were interacting, we kind of have to time travel a bit. Since we don't have time machines, we have to sort of use the Earth as a time machine. And so scientists that study the Earth and its processes are called geologists. And through the work of geologists, it's been discovered that the Earth has actually changed uh, quite a bit over the course of its over four billion year history. So if you could pull up this next slide, Jamie. What Jamie's going to pull up is an image of what the Earth 
looked like uh, at the end of the Cretaceous period, about 66 million years ago. And so I think you should be able to see it there. So you see, it looks roughly similar to today. It's not all that different, but you might notice some differences. One of them being, if you look at North America, uh, there is a seaway spread over much of the middle of North America. And so at the end of the age of dinosaurs, 66 million years ago, uh, or slightly before that, at times, uh, Montana was underwater. And then the seaway would sort of recede and, and uh, come back. And so it would expand and contract. And so uh, at times there would be the fossils of marine creatures in Montana. And at times you can find the fossils of land animals. But at the very end of the Cretaceous, the seaway was receding. And so there's a lot of coastal environments in Montana. Now, <clears throat> if we were interested, say, in the very end of the age of dinosaurs, uh, as paleontologists, if you wanted to find a Tyrannosaurus rex, for example, we would need to first know where to go in Montana to find uh, fossils of that age. We would need to know where rocks deposited during that time are found today. And so this is a uh, state geologic map of Montana uh, made by the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology in Butte. And uh, what you see here basically is the work of uh, geologists who have gone out and mapped the surface of uh, Montana, showing where certain geologic formations are exposed at the surface. And so basically all these different colors you see are different aged rocks at the surface of the earth. And one thing you might notice is there's a lot of green uh, on this map. And so if we look at geologic time, uh, green represents the Cretaceous period. And so uh, in geologic time, uh, dinosaurs lived in the Mesozoic era, and the Cretaceous is the very end, uh, the last of the three periods uh, in which dinosaurs were around. And so we can see that Montana is a great place to study the Cretaceous. Now, if we specifically wanted to find the very end of the Cretaceous, where animals like T. rex and Triceratops lived, we would be looking for what's called the Hell Creek Formation. And the Hell Creek is the geologic unit that represents the very end of the age of dinosaurs. On this map, it's sort of this light greenish color that you see in these areas and over here and here and some other places. And so if we were to take sort of a bird's eye view of the Hell Creek, if we could pull up the next slide, please, Jamie. <clears throat> if we were to just kind of go out and fly over uh, what the Hell Creek looks like for a minute, you can see uh, here, this is kind of looking down on the Hell Creek. You see lots of hills lots of exposure of rocks. And so you can see, again, uh, Montana is a great place to go and uh, discover uh, fossils of dinosaurs and other Cretaceous creatures because not only is the right age rock exposed at the surface of the earth, uh, but also the rocks aren't covered by, say, parking lots or malls or things like that. It's, it's right there at the surface. If we take a slightly closer look, um, next slide, please. <coughs> Uh, so here's a slightly uh, closer look at part of the Hell Creek Formation. And here you see that here's a hillside. And uh, what you're seeing is that there's different layers of rock that make up the hill. And basically by studying the geology uh, of the formation, you can learn a bit about the ancient environment. So you might notice that there's different colored layers. Uh, some of the tannish layers, those are typically what are called sandstones. Uh, those typically represent uh, the deposits of river channels. And then the grayish rocks you might see are mudstones and siltstones, and those are sort of the floodplain deposits, what was going on adjacent uh, to the rivers. And then also as you go from the bottom of a hill like this to the top, as you go up through the layers of rock, you're actually going up through layers of time because the layers at the bottom are older than the ones at the top. So as you might climb through a hill like this in the Hell Creek and look into the rocks, you get an idea of sort of the depositional environments of the time, but also if you were to find fossils preserved in these rocks, you'd be able to get a glimpse of some of the plants and animals that lived at the time. And so Scott's gonna uh, talk a bit about some of the smaller uh, organisms we might encounter in the Hell Creek Formation. Thanks, John. So um, as John said, uh, 66 million years ago, there was a uh, interior seaway, we call the Western Interior Seaway, that was regressing or retreating uh, but areas like eastern Montana where the Hell Creek Formation is exposed uh, at that time were coastal. Uh, basically, you had all of this sediment, all the stuff draining towards the seaway. So you had rivers and streams and 
some lakes and things like that. And it was much warmer and much wetter than it is today. Um, when you think of eastern Montana 66 million years ago, you really need to think of what the Gulf Coast states are like today. So like northern Florida, southern Louisiana, Alabama, those areas. Uh, subtropical, warm, wet, lush environments. And one of the ways we can reconstruct those environments are based on the fossils we find. We find very good examples of fossil plants and animals in the Hell Creek Formation that allow us to reconstruct that. Uh, one of the fossils I'm going to show you right now is in a Hell Creek or Lake Cretaceous palm. So this is an actual uh, partial palm frond um, from uh, the Hell Creek Formation. It's 66 million years old. And of course, most of us who have uh, done some traveling know that palms, palm fronds are typically found in warm, wet, subtropical environments. You go to the southern parts, southern states, you'll find that down Southern California, the, those areas. Uh, so that's one of our first indications that we have a much warmer, wetter environment 66 million years ago. This is another leaf fossil here that I'm going to show. Uh, again, it's a uh, it's an angiosperm. Uh, it's a flowering uh, flowering plant, uh, but it's a big broadleaf uh, fossil. And again, telling us that uh, we have a much more uh, moderate climate. Uh, that would allow these sort of trees and plants to grow. Uh, whereas if you go the, to uh, uh, eastern Montana now, it's very dry, arid. Uh, we also have invertebrate fossils that tell us that there were lots of streams and rivers at that time. And yes, there are some streams and rivers in eastern Montana now, but some of them are seasonal. And even the ones that are there year round can often uh, dry up or choke out. And we have good examples of fossil clams so here we have what we call uh, unionated bivalves. Uh, you can see in the back here, this is where they would hinge. Uh, and we can get really good invertebrate fossils, clams, snails, things like that, uh, from the Hell Creek. And again, these are freshwater clams, not clams that you would find in a sea or ocean. Um, beyond the fossil plants and invertebrates, we also find Lots of small fossils, what we call microfossils, from smaller animals. Uh, this box has a whole bunch of fossils uh, to uh, something you might guess what it is. Um, I've got a little one here, but this whole box is full of different little fossils. Any idea on what these might be? If you have a guess on what all of these are, uh, just put it in the chat box. Any guesses? One. Teeth. Raptor teeth. teeth. Bugs. Snails and clams. Scales. Bones. Wood chips. So teeth was a good guess. That these are shiny. They have a coating that makes them shiny like a tooth. Uh, but the person who said scales, you were right. These are fish scales. These are scales to a fish called a gar. Uh, this is a modern gar lives today. Uh, we can find gar all over uh, the United States, all the way from Florida up even here into Montana. But the really big gars you find down in the tropical areas. And you can see this thing has really gnarly teeth. This thing was a predator. It had almost an armored head. Um, and this fossil scale represents these here, these this kind of armor coating here is made up of hundreds, if not thousands, of fish scales. And so uh, gar are pretty cool fish. They look kind of primitive, but we have good examples of them in the Hell Creek. Uh, beyond fossil fish, we also get, um, well, we can get uh, fossil stingrays, freshwater stingrays and skates. We can get amphibians, uh, frogs even, again, telling us a much different environment. And of course, this here, is a partial carapace or top shell to a soft shell turtle. And again, we can get turtles here in, in Montana now, but this is a very large soft shell turtle, something that again you would see down in Florida. Um, and this is just the bottom part of the shell. Um, but the thing that really kind of helps seal it for uh, paleontologists when we're reconstructing environments is this fossil. This is a complete skull. And I'm going to turn it actually so it's kind of like any guesses as to what this is? You can just put it in the chat box and let us know. 
Alligator. Alligator, crocodile. Coyote. Okay, for those of you who said alligator crocodile, you're right on the nose. This is a type of crocodile. Uh, it is a late Cretaceous crocodile called a Borealisuchus. Um, and of course, crocodiles and alligators would not last very long up here in Montana today, right? Aside from it being very arid and dry in the summers, it can be very cold and wintry in the winters. We can have very long winters that kick in in October and go all the way through May, and that's not going to make a crocodile and alligator very happy. So again, really good evidence that 66 million years ago, this was a very warm and wet subtropical environment. Now besides um, all these other cool fossils that tell us a little bit about the environment, we also have other fossils that tell us about um, who else was here at the same time. We have fossil birds, uh, we have other fossil lizards, things like that. Uh, the one that surprises some people is this right here. It's very small, it's a little jaw. <laughs> This is a fossil jaw to a marsupial or pouched mammal um, called Didelphodon. Now, 66 million years ago, there were mammals running around, but they didn't get much bigger than a possum or a large raccoon. Um, a lot of people would be surprised to know that mammals were around almost as long as the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs were around for about 160 million years, and mammals and their earliest ancestors were right there along with them but they didn't get very big. They didn't get bigger than a raccoon. Um, but they were there and they're very diverse. And so this helps us give us a more complete picture of what the paleo environment was like, the paleo ecosystem, and all the other uh, you know, players in this environment besides dinosaurs. But now we're gonna get to the dinosaurs. So Scott introduced uh, one of the mammals you might encounter in the Hell Creek Formation, but uh, the dominant land animals at the time were the dinosaurs. And so we're going to take you through a brief uh, introduction of some of the dinosaurs you might encounter in the Hell Creek Formation. Uh, we'll start with one uh, with a photo of, if Jamie, if you can pull up the next slide, please. Uh, and Jamie's going to pull up an image of a dinosaur skeleton that's currently in our preparation lab right now. Uh, it's going to be the skeleton, there it is, of what's called a Thescalosaurus. Thescalosaurus was an herbivore or plant-eating dinosaur that lived uh, at, in the, at the end of the age of dinosaurs, the same time as uh, T. rex and triceratops. And occasionally in the Hell Creek Formation, you'll encounter the bones of Thescalosaurus. But this particular specimen is, is uh, go back please. This particular specimen is, is really exciting because it's an example of a dinosaur that is, was found articulated. So all the bones are still together. Uh, you can see the legs and the arms and the ribs and the tail vertebrae, and we have uh, much of the rest of the tail also collected. And then uh, just next to where this skeleton was collected, this, uh, this was collected in Makoshka State Park uh, in eastern Montana, and just next to where the skeleton was, uh, this was found. This is a cast of it, but this is the skull of this skeleton of Thescalosaurus. And so you can see right here, here's, here's the eye, and here's the mouth, and if we could look into the mouth, it has sort of these leaf-shaped teeth that are good for eating plants. And so Thescalosaurus was, uh, again, a plant-eating dinosaur that lived at the time, and wasn't the largest of plant-eating dinosaurs. It got to be about 10 to 15 feet long or so, uh, but there were much larger uh, herbivores in the Hell Creek ecosystem, one of them being the animal that this bone belongs to. This here is a humerus, or the upper arm bone, of a duck-billed dinosaur named Edmontosaurus. And duck-billed dinosaurs were very common in the Cretaceous period. They came in a variety of uh, shapes and sizes. Uh, some of them had elaborate bony crests and tubes on their heads. But Edmontosaurus, if we could pull up the next slide, please, looks something like uh, what we're going to see in this image. Edmontosaurus had uh, sort of a low, uh, flat skull, which you see in the lower right there. <coughs> and so it was thought to be a relatively unornamented dinosaur. But a kind of exciting recent discovery uh, made in Alberta was the discovery of a specimen of Edmontosaurus uh, that was well preserved, it preserved some of the soft tissues around the skull, and it was found that there was actually a soft crest uh, on the head of Edmontosaurus, 
sort of like what you might see uh, on a rooster today, so a, a fleshy crest. So an example of a, a dinosaur that uh, appeared to not have a, a structure or, or a crest on its head, but actually did. It just hadn't been found preserved yet. And so we'll see many examples of dinosaurs with uh, crests or horns on their skulls. Uh, if we look at another big herbivore from the Hell Creek ecosystem, anyone tell me what kind of dinosaur is this? Well, they are uh, brainstorming the answer to your question. Can you tell us real quick whether the Anotosaurus walked on four feet or two? Hmm. Uh, Anotosaurus is believed to be generally bipedal. I, it's, I think the evidence shows it starts out potentially as bipedal, but then could go back and forth quadruped to bipedal as adults. Yeah, as it got larger. So some guesses on that guy. We have an Allosaurus, an Ankylosaurus, a club-tailed dinosaur, a basket tail. <laughs> Very good. So this is an example of Ankylosaurus, one of the armored uh, dinosaurs, the Ankylosaurus, which are found in the Hell Creek uh, formation. Uh, but they're actually pretty rare in the Hell Creek, at least in the places where we've gone out into the formation. But what we do find our examples of the osteoderms or armor uh, plating in the ankylosaur. So here's an osteoderm from an ankylosaur right there. And so uh, often this is what we find of these animals. But they were present uh, in the Hell Creek at the time of T. rex and triceratops. Now, here's, here's a good question for you. Who can tell me? what this is. Type in those guesses. Let us know what you're thinking. An egg. That's a good guess. A head. Ah. So an egg. A pachycephalosaurus head. Wow, that's very specific <laughs> and correct. Uh, so that is the, uh, this is part of the skull of a pachycephalosaurus, uh, a model of a pachycephalosaurus over here. There we go, Pachycephalosaurus. Uh, Pachycephalosaurus, sometimes called one of the dome-headed dinosaurs. You can see the dome here. And so the bone that we were looking at was actually part of the cranial dome right here. And Pachycephalosaurus is often portrayed in movies and books as sort of ramming things uh, with its head. Uh, studies of the inside of the dome suggest that this might not have been uh, as possible as, as thought. Uh, and an interesting thing about Pachycephalosaurus that's been discovered relatively recently is that it didn't always have this dome on its head. If we look at younger examples of Pachycephalosaurus, like what Scott has here, here's a young Pachycephalosaurus, and this is where the dome would be, but you can see it's flat. And so as Pachycephalosaurus grew uh, to an adult, it would develop this dome on its skull. At the same time, you can see that there's these big spikes at the back of the head. Uh, these spikes would become resorbed or smaller as the animal grew up. And so it would undergo these dramatic changes throughout growth. This is called ontogeny, which is basically changes as these animals grew. And so we'll see that lots of dinosaurs in the Hell Creek uh, underwent pretty dramatic ontogeny, changes throughout growth. Another example is the animal that this belongs to. Does anyone know what this is? Type in your guesses. Claw, tooth, horn. These are all great guesses. Triceratops horn. Yep. Again, very specific and very correct. Uh, this this is the horn of a juvenile triceratops. So here's where the horn, uh, the eye would be, and so the front of the face would be going this way. And so this is a pretty small one. Triceratops, their heads got to be pretty gigantic. But at this small size, in a juvenile triceratops, you can see the horns uh, curve backwards. And so as triceratops grew from a baby to an adult, um, the horns would start out going backwards, and then they would eventually curve forwards. At the same time, uh, there's these spikes at the back of the frill of a triceratops. They would start off very spiky, and then as triceratops continued to grow, they would flatten uh, onto the edge of the frill. So the horns would change shape, the spikes would change shape, the frill would change shape. Uh, another example of a, a dinosaur undergoing dramatic changes uh, throughout growth. So much so that in some cases, <laughs> the different growth stages of some of these dinosaurs, when they were first discovered, 
were thought to be uh, different species of dinosaurs. And through studying uh, lots of examples of these dinosaurs and how they grew, it's being discovered that in some cases, these are actually just examples of how these animals grew from babies to adults. And so you might also notice that their heads are changing a lot. We're seeing animals with horns and spikes and domes and crests. And so it's thought that these structures might have functioned for some kind of display or visual communication between dinosaurs. Dinosaurs appear to have been very visual animals, sort of like birds today that are very colorful and have some of them have dramatic feather structures to display to one another with. So these are some of the uh, herbivorous dinosaurs we might encounter in the Hell Creek. Now Scott will talk to us a bit about some of the uh, carnivorous dinosaurs. Thanks. So John gave you an overview of all the piney dinosaurs in the Hell Creek, the very end of the Cretaceous. Now we're going to talk about the cool dinosaurs, right? Meat eaters. So we call meat eating dinosaurs theropods, a group of dinosaurs that include Allosaurus and Tyrannosaurus rex and your raptors, things like that. Uh, but what really makes up a theropod? What makes a meat eating dinosaur? Um, I'm going to pull a bone out here. Um, almost all of your meat eating dinosaurs, your theropods, are bipedal. Um, they start off uh, pretty much as small, uh, small dinosaurs in the Triassic and really diversify throughout all the different time periods. By the time we get here to the late Cretaceous, we've got some pretty cool and pretty well known theropod dinosaurs. Uh, what are some of your favorite meat eating dinosaurs? Uh, throw it in the chat channel. I'm sure that we've heard of some of these, but let us know what your favorite meat eating dinosaur is. Raptor, T Rex. Raptors and T Rex. Raptors and T Rex. I kind of figured that would come to the top. Claudine um, doesn't like dinosaurs. Who doesn't? <laughs> Claudine. She doesn't like meat eating dinosaurs? You like the plant eating dinosaurs? That's cool. <laughs> um, so, what I have here, I'm going to show you one of the characteristics that kind of unites all of the meat eating dinosaurs. Uh, this bone here is a foot bone called a metatarsal. This is the bottom part, the top part would be towards the body. It's broken, you can see right here. Uh, and if I turn it this way, and you look in right here, is this bone solid or is it hollow? Is there a hole in it? What do you see? Hollow, solid, hollow, hollow. That's right, so this opening here, this cavity, uh, shows that the bone is hollow, and it's one of those characteristics that is indicative of theropod or meaning dinosaurs, and also unites them with birds today. In fact, there are over a hundred physical characteristics that unites uh, meeting dinosaurs and birds, from hollow bones to uh, basically the structure of their eggshells to feathers. We have uh, good evidence of feathered dinosaurs, types of raptors, over raptors, things like that, and even primitive. Uh, basal tyrannosauroids that have feathers. So uh, it, every, pretty much everybody in the paleontology community and, bio, and biological communities uh, acknowledge that birds are the direct descendants of dinosaurs and will go so far as to say that birds are really dinosaurs. They're feathered dinosaurs that survived the extinction. Um, so we're going to talk about we're going to talk about raptors and we're going to talk about tyrannosaurs, um, but we're going to start with the smaller uh, the smaller meeting dinosaurs first. So uh, I've got a cast here. This is a, um, these are foot bones and this is, this is at the end of a foot bone. Any guess on what it is? This cast here. Throw that in the chat channel. Right off the bat, claw, raptor claw. Those who guess claw and raptor claw are, again, right on the nose. This is a, this is a claw to a type of raptor, but not Velociraptor. It is called Deinonychus. It is a raptor dinosaur, um, and we refer to raptor dinosaurs as dromaeosaurs, the group dromaeosaur, um, that lived here in Montana about 100 million years ago. But again, it's not a Velociraptor. I do have a cast of a Velociraptor skull here. Now, this might shock some of you Jurassic Park fans because this is about as big as it got. Okay, so for those of you who've seen Jurassic Park, the raptors are as big as I am. Uh, but in reality, the last raptor didn't get much bigger than this. It would have been the size of kind of a small to mid-sized dog. 
but again, has all the features of a, a mediating theropod, a hollow skull, sharp recurved teeth. Um, and interestingly, velociraptors have not been found in North America. This particular type of dinosaur is found in Mongolia, many thousands of miles uh, from here, uh, and uh, found in rocks that are a little bit older than the Hell Creek. So do we have a raptor in the Hell Creek? The answer is yes. Um, I've got a cast here of part of a skull. So this is the upper jaw, the maxilla, and this is the lower jaw of uh, a little raptor called Akira raptor. Um, and it is, if we compare it in size to this velociraptor, maybe a little bit bigger, but not by much. Um, so again, this would have been a, a raptor running around the same time as T-Rex and Triceratops, about the size of uh, maybe a small, uh, small dog, mid-sized dog. Uh, the question we don't know about this is because we do not have a lot of specimens. We don't know if this is a juvenile or if this is an adult. So maybe this got bigger. We just don't know yet. But it is evidence that there were raptors running around the Hell Creek. Okay. Now, the next slide we're going to throw up is an animal that has raptor in its name, but it is actually not a dromaeosaur. It's not a raptor. It's called uh, an oviraptor, oviraptorosaur. Again, the very first ones of these were found in Mongolia. Some of them were found actually brooding their nest, sitting on their nest with their arms uh, swept back to help incubate their eggs. Um, and several different species, actually dozens of species, have been found in Mongolia uh, and in China. Uh, and for a long time, we saw bits and pieces of what we thought were oviraptors here in North America. And then over the last several years, we started finding good skeletons. And it turns out that the North, one of the North American versions of the oviraptor called uh, Anzu got quite large. This animal was bigger than me. Its head would have been about... Um, about seven feet off the ground. It was very bird-like. Uh, we have good evidence that uh, oviraptors were feathered. They had very hollow bones. Interestingly, um, oviraptors, and like Anzu here, had no teeth. They were indentulous. And that tells us, based on the evidence, that these were probably omnivores. Can somebody tell me what an omnivore is? Eats meat and plants, only eats plants, plants and meat, plants and meat, plants and meat. Okay, for those of you who said plants and meat, you are right. So carnivorous animals eat predominantly uh, meat, other animals, uh, herbivores, predominantly plants, and then omnivores are what we call generalists. They do a little bit of both. And so oviraptors were probably eating seeds, nuts, plants, and maybe small lizards, uh, small mammals, things like that. So uh, they're pretty cool. Uh, and again, one of those uh, one of those theropods that shows us some really bird-like characteristics. All right, now we're going to move on to uh, probably the most famous. It is, well, it isn't probably it's the most famous dinosaur. It's probably the best known organism, uh, and that's Tyrannosaurus rex. And uh, if you bring up the next slide. While we're doing that, what part of Montana were the raptors found in, Scott? Um, this would have been the Hell Creek Formation up by Jordan for the uh, for the Akira Raptor, um, and the Anzu specimen um, uh, here in Montana was found down in Carter County. Anzus were also found um, over in the Dakotas in the Hell Creek Formation as well. The Hell Creek Formation actually goes into the Dakotas. So, so here we have uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, this artwork, again, very familiar dinosaur, I think familiar to everyone. Uh, one of the largest uh, and most massive of the theropod dinosaurs, topping out over 42, 43 feet long, 15 feet tall at the hip, four and a half, five foot long skull, probably weighed around eight tons in life. Um, and the first thing that people zone in on, of course, are its big teeth, but then they kind of zone in on its forearms. Um, and it has very small forearms compared to the rest of its body. And one of the questions that always gets asked is, what, what were those forearms for? So let's just talk about a few things. Uh, I have in my hand another fossil. This is a Tyrannosaurus specimen. Any guesses on what this is? A little 
closer. Claws and teeth are our guesses. All right. Claw, it, it is a Tyrannosaurus Rex hand claw. Um, we're missing the, just the part of the tip here, but it's a pretty complete fossil. Um, they had bony claws, just like an eagle, and on the outside of the claw would have been a sheath made of keratin, which is the stuff your fingernails are made of. You actually see what we call the blood groove here. There would have been a blood vessel that fed the keratin. Um, so they had, hand, they had claws on their hands. Well, what would he have claws on your hands for? Is it mostly for grabbing things and things like that, right? Um, I'm going to show you this bone here. This bone is a very interesting bone for a Tyrannosaurus. Um, any guesses on what bone it is? Let us know what you're thinking. What bone is Scott holding? What part of the body? Small arm bone. Arm bone. Femur. Arm. Little arm. Rib. Okay. Well, for those of you who answered little arm bone, you are correct. Uh, this bone is called the ulna. It's the large bone in your forearm. So if everyone just takes their forearm, grabs a hold right here, and you feel the big bone in here, that's your ulna. Now watch this. I've got my arm up, right? Here's my ulna. It goes from here to here, right? Look at that. My ulna is considerably bigger than a T-Rex's ulna. Pretty surprising when you consider that a T-Rex dwarfs me in size, right? So that begs the question, what, what were they doing with their forearms? And there's been a lot of hypotheses. Were they using them for prey apprehension? Even though these arms were small, they were heavily muscled. We can see where muscles attach, and each arm could have hold probably about 400 to 500 pounds in that range. So they were brawny, even though they had small arms. So maybe prey apprehension. Some uh, paleontologists have suggested that maybe if a T-Rex was kind of squatting down or resting, it may have used these arms to push up or push off the ground. And then other paleontologists suggested that these arms are becoming vestigial, that they don't need to use them. Well, why wouldn't they need to use their forearms? Could it have something to do with their giant head and their big teeth? Well, let's talk about that. All right, so. Tyrannosaurus rex, besides its small arms and large size, is known for its big teeth. And that's what I have here in my hand. I have a Tyrannosaurus rex tooth. And the whole tooth isn't exposed, just like our teeth aren't exposed. I'm going to basically put my fingers right around where the gum line would be. So this is the crown, just like this is the crown of my tooth here, the teeth. that When you smile, we're seeing the crowns of your teeth. The roots are down in the sockets of the jaw. Take a look at this. I've got about four, four or five inches here of tooth exposed crown, and then I've got over twice that in the root. So that tells us that Tyrannosaurus rex teeth were very strong, very stable. They're shaped kind of like bananas or rail spikes, which means they're structurally really sound. It'd be very hard to break this tooth if I was yanking on the left or right or front or back, which is good. If you are an animal that is basically predating on other animals and you go up to a triceratops that weighs almost as much as you and you bite, that triceratops isn't just going to sit there and let you do it. It's going to fight, right? It's going to pull and run and do everything it can to get away from you. So you've got to have teeth that are really strong. And you keep in mind, Tyrannosaurus rex has got about 60 or so of these teeth in its mouth. So it gets a hold and wants to stay holding on until that animal's dead so it can eat it, right? So these are very strong teeth. In fact, they're so strong that we have good evidence that they were used to crush bones. We have uh, Triceratops bones and Monosaurus bones that are crushed up. We even have uh, Tyrannosaurus coprolites, fossilized poop, that has chunks of bones in it. So that tells us that not only were they crushing bones, but they were eating bones. And if you take a look at this jaw that I'm going to show you, this is a T-Rex, the real T-Rex jaw. And this is the outer surface here. I'm going to put it on my shoulder so you can see the tooth row. All these little openings are two sockets. I've got a tooth coming up here. The teeth have come out, but um, dinosaurs regenerate their teeth throughout their whole life. So as this tooth comes out, there'd be another tooth coming up behind it. Eventually, that tooth would break off, and there'd be a germ tooth right behind it, ready to take its place. 
And we can tell, again, by how massive and thick this uh, jaw is, and the other part of the jaw would have been here where the muscles attach, that this would have had incredible bite force. Uh, a fully grown Tyrannosaurus rex had a bite of over 7,000 pounds, which makes it the, the most, uh, the strongest bite of any vertebrate animal known at this time. So whatever it got in its mouth, it was gonna crush. But they didn't always start this way. Tyrannosaurus rex, of course, came out of an egg. Came out as a baby when it hatched. Even though we don't have Tyrannosaurus rex eggs or nests, we do have nests of other dinosaurs, and so we can estimate general size based on that. The largest known dinosaur egg ever found is a little bit bigger than a bowling ball. So we can say that a Tyrannosaurus rex egg probably wouldn't have been bigger than that. It would have been maybe a little bit smaller. And that your T-Rex, when it came out of its egg, would have been 18 to 24 inches in length, so maybe about like this. Kind of cute, probably, and probably feathered, it had a little dino fuzz on it. Um, but they grew up fairly quickly. And by the time they got to be teenagers, they had jaws that looked like this. This is a cast of a dinosaur nicknamed Jane. It's at the Burpee Museum of Natural History in Rockford. Um, and you can see that it is more slender. The jaw is more slender. The teeth are not big bananas or rail spikes, but they're more blade-like and kind of compressed. And they have serrations front and back. They're more like kind of like the teeth that you see on this little Archaeoraptor here. So that tells us that, that juvenile Tyrannosaurs were probably eating, well, definitely eating something different than the big adults, uh, and that means that they were interacting differently with their environment. And it also tells us that they went through a really big change as they grew up. So I'm going to borrow Jamie for a sec, because we're going to show you three different versions of a T-Rex uh, jaw. So here we have the juvenile, the 12-year-old juvenile T-Rex. Here we have an intermediate, basically a subadult Tyrannosaurus rex right jaw that's not quite done growing. And then we have this big, massive jaw with these giant teeth. And it shows basically a growth series from juvenile up to adult. I'll come down maybe just a little. There you go. Now I can see all three. And so we go from an animal that couldn't crush bone to an animal that could crush bone. And again, we've talked about that process before. We refer to that as ontogeny. And so what's really cool when you think about it is that dinosaurs are changing as they grow up, just like we change as we grow up. Uh, not too surprising. Tells us about a very dynamic system. Tells us about uh, how these animals interact with each other and also their environment, which is really cool. And we can learn all this stuff from the fossils, the rock record, and basically over 100 years worth of work that's been going on in the Hell Creek. And that uh, leads us up to, well, the dinosaurs were dominant. What happened to them? Um, before we move away from T-Rex, what is the youngest T-Rex skull that we have? The smallest T-Rex skull thus far discovered is a specimen on display here at the museum, uh, nicknamed Chomper, discovered in 2010. Uh, the skull is estimated to be about this this big or so, if it was complete. Uh, we don't yet know the age of that specimen. I think the youngest one that's been aged so far, Scott, would that be Jane? Um, for the time being, yes. There are some new specimens that are at other museums that are being worked on uh, that may be younger than Jane, but Jane was about 11 to 12 years old uh, when she died based on uh, work by Dr. Greg Erickson. And do we have the teeth that would have fit into that big cast? Or no, the real one. This specimen uh, at yeah. the middle. Yes, is this is one of them here, Scott? Yep. Yes, so we have a bunch of uh, teeth that would uh, fit into that, that jaw and the upper jaws. We have a drawer full of teeth from this specimen. Uh, it's nicknamed B-Rex, discovered by Bob Harmon here at the Museum of the Rockies. Thank you. Oh, uh, so <laughs> we're uh, at the end of the at, at the end of the Cretaceous. So we've talked about uh, T. Rex and other theropods and plant-eating dinosaurs as well. And then at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, the dinosaurs some, something happens, and and the dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, go extinct. So if we pull up the next slide, there's evidence for something striking the Earth at the end of the Cretaceous period—a large uh, asteroid or comet 
which struck just off the coast of uh, present-day Mexico. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, we, takes us back to a map we showed you a bit earlier that shows what the world looked like 66 million years ago. And you see it points to the Chicxulub impact site just off of present-day Mexico. So there's actual uh, evidence of, of the uh, crater for this impact event. Research continues into whether or not it was just this event that caused the extinction of all dinosaurs, but except for birds, or if other factors were at play. But if you are in the health information, and if you, for example, climb up some of those hills through the layers of time in the formation, eventually you'll come to the top of the formation, and you will no longer be able to find the fossils of T. rex and Triceratops and Edmontosaurus and other dinosaurs. They, they have gone extinct. And so in time, you would be at the end of the Cretaceous, the end of the Mesozoic era, and at the start of the Cenozoic era, which is sometimes called the age of mammals, because when the dinosaurs, the big dinosaurs went extinct, uh, little mammals, which Scott showed you an example of uh, earlier that had been around kind of in the shadows of the dinosaurs, were able to diversify and become the dominant uh, land animals on Earth, as they are today. Uh, and so uh, basically this was a look through uh, the ancient ecosystem of the Hell Creek. And the Hell Creek ecosystem is just one example of an ancient ecosystem that as paleontologists we can study. There are examples that might be closer to where you are, uh, or you can look at examples from different periods in time, from millions of years before the Hell Creek Formation, or millions of years after. But by using evidence from fossils and geology, uh, we can get a, a pretty good view of what life was like uh, in the past. And so I think we have a few minutes left in case there's any questions about what we've just said. Remind us how many years ago the past was. Uh, we're talking about the Hell Creek Formation? Mm -hmm. So the top of the Hell Creek Formation, the very end of it, the end of the Mesozoic era, uh, was about 66 million years ago. Uh, so we're, we've just been talking about dinosaurs that lived in about one to two million years before uh, the end of the Cretaceous period. All right. Got a couple questions from our friends in Cook City. Does the Museum of the Rockies have a Gigantosaurus fossils? Giganotosaurus? Yeah, that's uh, what you're right. <laughs> no, we do not have any fossils of Giganotosaurus, which is a large theropod dinosaur from South America. Um, the largest terrestrial meat-eating dinosaur in, in the area uh, is Tyrannosaurus rex at the very end of the Cretaceous. Also from Cook City, does the Museum of the Rockies have Arithnomimus and Hedrosaurus fossils, obviously not a paleontologist. Um, <laughs> so one of the theropods I didn't talk about uh, is the Ornithomimus. Uh, those are the ostrich mimic dinosaurs. Um, in the Jurassic Park movies, the, they're the Gallimimuses. Again, Gallimimus is known from uh, Mongolia or from Asia, uh, but we did have here in North America, North American versions called Struthiomimus and Ornithomimus. And we do have fossils from the Hell Creek uh, of those types of ornithomimids. Uh, what was the other dinosaur that you asked about? Hadrosaurus? Yes. So, so Edmontosaurus, which John talked about earlier, is a type of hadrosaur. Hadrosaur refers to the group of duck-billed dinosaurs, and Edmontosaurus is one of those branches um, of, of hadrosaurs. So yes, we do have hadrosaurs here. Well, I'm going to brutalize this one. Uh, Mophosaurus fossils? Mophosaurus. I'm not familiar with that one. I don't know that one. God. Oh, you stumped them. Yeah. We're going to have to go do some research. Um, are T Rex and Raptors the same? No. Um, Tyrannosaurus Rex and Raptors are theropods, so they are meeting dinosaurs. Um, but they are different anatomically and evolutionarily from each other. Um, they belong to a group um, that makes them, let's say, more closely related to each other than, let's say, Tyrannosaurus rex is to Allosaurus. Allosaurus, which live in the Jurassic, and Tyrannosaurus rex are not closely related at all. Uh, so your Dromaeosaurs, your Raptors, and T-Rex are more closely related than that, but they are not the same type of dinosaur. 
All right. And last one, are birds dinosaurs? Yes. yes. All right. <laughs> For that, we will come to an end here today. Thanks again for joining us. Um, I encourage you as you leave us today to go out and practice being scientists like John and Scott here. Ask lots of questions about the things you see. We live on a really awesome planet. And send us an email if you have some awesome questions that you would like the answer to. We will see you not again in the 18-19 school year. Um, so we hope you have a great spring. And yeah, tune in again next year. We'll see you all soon. Thank you so much for joining us.